Hello, everyone, and welcome to FCI Live. This is our winter 2023 series. Thanks for coming and being a part of it. We're wrapping up our first week. We have a whole nother week to go, but we're wrapping up with a topic near and dear to my heart. It was so exciting to get to talk to this speaker and uh, share our mutual passion for how important this is. This session is earning your owner's business. And our guest tonight is Peter Waldman, who is the general manager of Food Shed Co-op. He's gonna be talking to us about this assumption we tend to make that our owners will of course come out and shop the store. And the reality is that even with good marketing efforts and outreach to our owners, we usually only see about 50% of the existing pre-open owners become regular shoppers. So we have to go out of our way to actually court them as shoppers, not just as owners, because we're no longer asking them to support a concept, we're asking them to change their shopping habits. And that takes making them feel valued as a shopper. But you don't wanna to listen to me talk about it. We're gonna have Peter talk about it. Um, so I'm going to welcome Peter, and uh, thanks so much for being here tonight, Peter. Thank you, JQ. How are you? Good? I'm good. good. Awesome. Good. Well, I, I certainly appreciate everyone taking time out to join me this evening. Uh, my name's Peter. I sell food. That's how I help. I'm a general manager for the Food Shed Co-op. I just want to take a moment uh, to thank JQ and the entire FCI team for this series. I was able to join a GM reporting dashboard yesterday, and I found it super informative, and I'm hoping y'all find the same. My topic, converting owners to shoppers, not an easy task. Um, we would certainly need to earn their business in a very competitive shopping landscape. <clears throat> the outlined approach before I whip out my PowerPoint deck um, that I found at least favorable throughout my career for customer acquisition. Number one, understanding your audience. Uh, we'll go through uh, audience review on and foodies and stuff like that. And then two, learning what drives their purchasing decisions. Um, so we're gonna review that. And then we're gonna culminate those two things into a brand building exercise with distinction and purpose. Um, purposeful companies, seem to do well and last longer. Um, I use Volvo as an example. Um, they are selling safe transportation compared to vehicles. And, and I have found purposeful companies do well. Um, and then finally, uh, delivering a grocery store with a vision of the owners. I must say that I think we're all starting ahead because everyone eats and we sell food. Let's take a look at this thing. Um, there we go. Can you see my screen? Thank you. Awesome. And you can hear me good. Yep, as far as open forum, you can listen to me talk for an hour, up to you. I've got about an hour's worth of material. Or you can engage in this process and ask questions however you see fit, whether it's in chat or if you have the guts and you want to unmute your phone, certainly feel free to do that. Um, moving on, the summary, uh, your owners will automatically shop with their co-op when it opens, right? Nope. On average, 50% or less of pre-open owners shop with their co-op regularly. And I just think that's odd because, you know, when I first was studying this topic, it's like, well, you own the business. I, I need to earn your business. You own it. Um, but it is the case. Uh, a lot of uh, our owners have choices and they make similar decisions as any other consumer. In this presentation, we'll explore customer shopping habits and what your operational team will need to think about to earn your weekly business, at least a part of it. We'll review keys to understanding your business differentiations, customer buying value attributes, and owner to shopper acquisition tactics. Sounds really formal. Yeah, I got really excited before I did this, right? Um, there's a little script about me on the right, just in case you were wondering my credibility, I suppose. Um, but let me move this screen up a little bit. Uh, one of the most important things misspelled to remember when creating a brand is you must first know who your audience is. And that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to look at the agenda. Sorry about that. Uh, first agenda, consumer groups, consumer value, brand positioning, surveying your owners, owner benefits, and managing expectations. So let's take a look at the consumer groups as I move my screen around. So first group that I look at is the allergy food sensitive customers. 
Typically, they have some kind of allergy, peanut allergies a lot, gluten intolerance, food sensitivities. There are a few of many food-related issues consumers face today. A store targeting that consumer group uh, should strive to be a resource for products and knowledge regarding natural and organic industry to help customers navigate and filter ingredients and food groups. So that's one group that you may target. We certainly are. And then you have another group. That's the diet conscious clean eaters. Um, they've become more aware of the foods they eat and strive to enrich their lifestyles with wholesome natural foods. If you're targeting this group, which I think a lot of us are, you wanna work to provide a filter for your shoppers. Sell a wide variety of products that are organic, natural, and non-GMO, products that are made from whole, clean, natural ingredients. So as we build the store brand, at least at the food shed, we're trying to understand our customers in advance so we could build a store in that vision. Foodies, um, foodies have high expectations for ingredients and flavor. Perishable quality comes at a premium. Um, in order to attract this base, you'll need to provide staff personnel that has a level of expertise in culinary food preparation and meat and seafood categories are typically a standard uh, for that foodies group. So those of people who shop at a Whole Foods, they definitely are attracting that foodie group, right? Uh, moving on, the final group that I'm looking at is supplement takers, uh, people who supplement their diet with uh, dietary supplements and have become more aware of the foods they eat and strive to enrich their lifestyle with wholesome natural foods. And then in order to execute that, that, that group at least, you'll need to work to provide an expansive variety staff with knowledgeable personnel. Um, you'll hear me say a couple times in this presentation, we can't be everything to everybody. So you need to know what you're gonna be the best at. Um, and in our case, it's produce, and food prep. And that's the consumer groups that we're targeting. Any comments or questions out there before I move on to my next slide? Silence is deafening. Um, so now that you have these groups that you know that we're targeting, how are you gonna get them? Um, and what we're gonna look at is a value table. Um, the values are fairly similar. They just move around, right? So price is a value set for just about every consumer out there. And you're in a competitive market, uh, so you're going to need to be aware of that. When you're entering into the value, the price segment, you'll need to focus in at the store level on price checks. You need to know how much bananas are being sold at, at all your competitors. Um, so price checks are really critical. And then your pricing structure. Um, all successful retail grocers have a variable pricing structure. Um, so they'll have some things at a higher margin and some things at a lower margin. So as an example, a lost leader may be avocados. We may sell them at cost, and we understand that avocados have natural affinities to things like maybe garlic and cilantro and chips, and you could raise your margin on those elements to make up for your lost leader. So having a variable price structure is really important uh, to hit that first uh, pillar of customer value, which is price. Next is having everyday pricing. So you'll have price changes, right? Eggs are going way high. What I recommend is you have a core of items that are everyday low price. So you're not going up and down based on the market. So you have what I would call an EDLP program, an everyday low pricing program. That'll give you a better price perception, which is really very valid in the industry, how people will perceive your pricing structure. So very important uh, for the number one value set. And then, as I mentioned before, having lost leaders and, and really promoting them. So you've got price number one. Number two is service. Um, this is very important to everybody. It breaks down into customer engagement, making sure your personnel enjoys the interaction and is able to articulate about the foods they're selling. Next is store cleanliness. That's a very big part of service. When you talk about customer service, I think it's such a big bucket, right? You wanna break it down into segments. Um, so service, customer engagement, store cleanliness, speed of checkout, time is always of a premium, and in stock position. Because if I go in your store and I wanna buy rotisserie chickens as an example, and you don't have them, it's really not gonna do me very good. And then I'll end up going to another store 
um, and maybe finding my new home. So, so far on the value set, we have price and service. What do you think we're missing? Anybody? So I see you smiling at me, thank goodness. Okay, let's move on. Quality, uh, very important. Um, bait checks, perishable quality, recipe disciplines, health and sanitation. These are all filling that, uh, uh, that really promise you know, that you're making to your consumers about quality. And then finally, selection. Um, and selection would be destination categories. And we're gonna show you what that looks like here in a minute expansive selections. When you have a 40,000 square foot store, you have an expansive variety, right? Alternative options, uh, particularly going after those uh, foodies um, and allergy sensitive folk, and then category representation. So that is the value table and it changes depending on what your offerings are. Uh, so from a consumer perspective, if I'm thinking just Peter, for example, my number one value set is quality. I am a, I, I'm a foodie. I love quality food. So I'm willing to spend a little bit more money in order to get the quality profile. Everyone's very unique depending, um, but you need to understand that uh, from a customer acquisition standpoint on how people are making decisions to shop at your store. Um, if it's primarily driven by price, uh, you need to be aware of that. If it's primarily driven by selection, you need to be aware of that as well. A uh, customer value table will move around. It's important when you build a co-op, and I think we have a lot of startup co-ops, is to understand your customer target groups, your customer value sets, and to build your store accordingly in order to find success. Um, JQ, what are your thoughts? I, I think it's the first time you've seen these categories. Do you have any comments? I think that the what would occur to me that this might be hard for board members to wrap their mind around is, you know, this all makes like, okay, this is how retail works. This is what grocery does, but well, why would our owners be that price sensitive or why would, you know, like, why wouldn't they be forgiving these, you know, the quality mis the service mistakes. And I think, I think thinking about the owner as consumer on some of these might be a really tricky thought. And I wonder if you have more, you know, to say like, you know, have you seen in co-ops, I mean, and I have, you know, people are like, well, but they're owners. I'm like, I have never found, maybe you've experienced differently. I have never found that other than our very core owners, that our owners are less price sensitive than anyone else. They will complain nicer. <laughs> right. You, you've, you've got your owner advocates that are going to shop at the store. They're advocating for it, uh, but that's a, a, a small bucket. Um, you're really targeting your owners as customers. Um, and, and, and I think of the numbers, you know, 50, less than 50% of all owners shop in the store. And some co-ops out there, 70% of all their sales come from owners. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic. Um, yeah, and it's all about, I think, learning to, as you say, treat them, to make sure they're satisfied as customers as right. well. I would say our co-op was at 70% um, when I was running it for, of, of owners where it was the sh were shopping dollars. It was from owners, but we had the values part down and we're really invest involving them, but, and they didn't want to think that it was about price to them, but we were doing incredible work around price and product mix at the same time. That isn't how we sold it to them. I think that's interesting. I wonder, I, I don't mean to get you off track here, but mm -hmm. like we talked about values, big and bold, but we also made sure we called it in our store, respecting their dollar, that we were respecting their dollar. Um, but they didn't necessarily want to be courted the same exact way. They wanted to believe they were values-based shopping only, which they were. They just needed us to be a good grocery store. Have you seen that? Do you feel like the same messaging always works or that around some of these that you have to treat owners a little differently? I think you have to treat them a little bit differently. It's important to listen to them in the beginning um, and, you know, I, my punchline at the very end is, is to resist the urge to overpromise. It, it's hard. When you go into recruit an owner, right, you, you don't say, oh, we're going to be a small store with average selection. You don't do that because no one's going to join. Um, so you find yourself in this disposition to say, you know, we're going to be great at this and great at that. And then you set that bar real high. And then when they actually shop the store, it falls short. Um, at least potentially of the expectation, um, and they're making they're they're making not social decisions when they shop at your store. They're making purchasing decisions, 
Um, and that really has these four values uh, above price, service, quality, and selection that need to be filled it based on the competition. So it's a great point, JQ. Um, uh, yes, Grant, the, no, the number I said, the 70%, that was on, uh, based at open co-op, so it would be on active owners, where the first stat on 50% or less of your pre-open owners obviously weren't you know, on active. So it, it's, they're all active owners, but it's a different, it's apples to oranges a little bit, if that's what you're pointing out. And it's true that this established food co-op is aiming for 50% of their customer base and of their dollars to come from their owners. And some of us do exceed that, but it is based on the active owners, not the inactives. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I see chat loaded up, <clears throat> JQ, if anything's in there that we want to go over, I'm just going to I want to scroll back up a little bit because I want to help you understand how to create a brand from this information. So um, go ahead, JQ, anything in the chat? That was the only one that had popped up. So I always wanted to answer that real quick. Let's go into brand. Okay, well, let's look at this first. So we've got four groups that we're targeting, at least collectively, the allergy food sensitive group, the dietary conscious clean eater group, foodies, and supplement takers. You can't be everything to everyone, right? We're going to target certain groups and then we're going to set our company up based on these four values, on what we would perceive to be the number one value set for the general population of our ownership base. Um, and then we're going to take that information and we're going to set a brand positioning up. And that is this slide right here as I move around my desktop screen. I want you to look at this. Um, so this is our brand statement right here. We're a community-owned and controlled grocery store open to the public. Um, that is what sets us aside from any kind of uh, normal type of business like a Whole Foods, right? In this case, for the Food Check Co-op, we're prioritizing local suppliers whenever possible. We're here to be a place to gather, shop, and nourish our family of community members. We contribute to our community with access to affordable quality food and are committed to teaching people about the foods they eat. So that really aligns in a couple of buckets, right? When you think about the targeted audience we're trying to attract, you could see price is really important, in my opinion, to this group. So it's in there. Same with local. And that we're not just selling food, we're teaching about the food you're putting in your body. And we're not just buying food, we're there to gather. So this is how I understand our collective owner's will for the business. And this is the statement that we put together to make sure that we're honoring that commitment. As I mentioned before, you can't be everything to everybody. So in the food sheds case scenario, we're 9,000 square feet, 7,000 retail. We're competing against Walmart, which is 50, 60,000 square feet or Whole Foods, which is 30,000 square feet. There's no way that we could go head to head with Whole Foods and have a better category throughout the entire store, right? We're not going to have more expansive dietary supplements and et cetera down the line. So in order to be viable and, and competitive in the market trade area, we need to find our destination categories, the areas of our business that we can compete in. Um, and number one for us is produce. Our produce department is a customer destination committed to selling only the best quality sustainable, local, and organic produce available in the marketplace. So that's how we set up our value set for produce. We have an expansive selection, comparatively speaking, where it's the breadth of items are going to be pretty big. We're going to focus in on local first. Whenever sustainable local is not available to our produce buyer, then we'll move into the organic produce variety. So produce is an area, even though we're half the size of some of our competition, that we are committed to being as good, if not better than our competition. And then food preparation. As I move my screen around, I don't know if you guys do these presentations much, but the pictures come up. Food preparation department, a delicious destination committed to offering in-house made. So we're making products in-house, ready to eat fresh foods. You'll always be able to pronounce the ingredients we use clean and simple from our kitchen to your table. And that's that limited ingredient. So we're really trying to focus and, and target that allergy sensitive person and that person converting to natural foods. The other destination category, which we didn't include in here, would be bulk. Um, we have a, an expansive bulk variety. Uh, we know that it aligns with the environment. It offers a variety and uh, it's much, uh, much better, I think, from a consumer standpoint. 
So I was able to take the buckets that we were attracting, the value sets that I perceive that are going to be out there in the market, and create a brand that is in line with the owner's vision, because that is super important. Brand positioning. Um, comments from the group on that. You guys are um, going to buy back time. Go ahead, JQ. <laughs> We, we do have a comment, actually, Rusty jumping in, saying they heard about a recipe a week that gave consumers recipes to feed a family of four for a set amount. Um, you're thinking about these type, offering these types of incentives to look, to look hard at price and value. Um, so I think it was him kind of adding in about that. Sure, um, sure. I have a question for you, though. Oh, look out. What you got? This is a very specific brand position that is perfectly suited to your community and to your owner base. Can you talk a little bit about like, you know, I know partially you probably took this job because you saw that alignment, but how did you come into the community and, and you know, not everyone's brand position is going to be the same. How did you find this brand position? How did you investigate this as a GM? And, and so you've operationalized some of big picture vision stuff here right. in some very specific ways. Yeah. How, how should a GM be thinking about that? Well, I think you just segued into my next slide. Um, I think <laughs> you did that just perfectly. Um, and that is by asking questions. Um, and there are a variety of ways to go ahead and do that. Uh, probably the most effective way is to survey your owners, right? Um, so I'm going to walk you through some survey questions that we asked our owners. Uh, number one, how often are you most likely to purchase products from a bulk department? And you could see the results here, um, a very small wedge for never, uh, occasionally 46.3%, occasionally by bulk. This is post-COVID, right? Uh, before COVID, bulk was one of the highest growth categories in the industry, uh, but COVID certainly changed it. And then regularly 36%. So I looked at that data, JQ, and I said to myself, well... I'm not sure that sales per square footage is going to make a whole lot of sense for bulk. That was my internal feeling is that, well, you know, I'm not sure we're going to get the sales per square footage of two gondolas. But then I listened to our board and I listened to the owners. And it's very important to have an environmentally responsible business uh, that really limits uh, plastic and almost eliminates single use plastic. And I was led to believe to be true to our core value and our core value is to be champions of the environment that we needed a bulk category. And that's how I made our decision on bulk. Excellent. We've got a kind of question. Yeah, I see Sue clapping because me and her talk about that a lot. Uh, go for the <laughs> question. Well, and, and I do want to stress, some of you maybe here who are from a very different type of community, you're working on food access. So the same values are not always going to be centered and operationalized the same way. And that is also okay. Um, so Grant asked, what role does a marketing manager play in building the brand positioning? Um, I think based on, you know, how much of it you had done with the board here, uh, what are your thoughts? Oh, I'm laughing at Sue. I see Sue, my partner in crime over there. Um, the, well, very actively, I, I think really as a, a sounding board is really important. Um, and, uh, the execution of this is critical. So what my outreach director will do is we'll talk regularly on this stuff. And then the outreach director will create a brand book, something that speaks to our message uh, so we could uh, communicate it to our owners. I hope that answers your question, Grant. Okay. Are you ready? I don't see Sue smiling at me. Yeah. Okay. Let's mm -hmm. do it. Let's look at the next question. Uh, what would best describe the food shed? This really helped me quite a bit, this question. Um, although it's a small sample size, 219 folks replied, it's still enough uh, to get a good sense. Um, our owners, the, and this was an owner poll, see this as a community grocery store. So what does that tell me? Look at the health food store. You see that health food, that small slice right there? So that helps me with my SKU selection. So I know we're not a health food store. Um, we're going to have to carry basic food items, right, that are affordable uh, instead of that high-end all natural, no, no, well, we're not going to do antibiotics anyway. Don't worry, Sue. But um, no white flour, no partially hydrogenated. That's what a health food store does. Um, and that's not how our owners see it. Are we a specialty food store? Look at that green, really small, right? A specialty food store, as an example, would have 10 different cold-pressed olive oils. And, and it takes a, an inventory investment to do it. It also takes a breadth of category to do it. 
So if, if we had most of our owners wanted to be a specialty food store, we probably just have grocery because that's about 9,000 square feet all by itself. Um, so that's how I was able to determine our profile, basically, uh, that we're a community food store. Um, we're not a specialty food store or a health food store. Natural foods are important in this group, and we want to provide alternative selections uh, so they could learn about the foods they're putting in their body and experiment with us and hopefully convert to a healthier um, item to choose from. Pause for questions. Moving on, we're almost done. So y'all are buying back time. JQ, you said you'd fill my airspace. I asked um, a question in the chat, actually. Um, I was just wondering about- How are you? Hi, good, how are you? That specific question um, about how you would describe the store, I'm wondering if that was asked before the store was open, because if so, I'm wondering how the owners, what did they base their answer on if they didn't have a store yet to describe? Well, it was certainly done before the store was open because um, our store is not open yet, uh, just as a matter of record. Um, but they're aware um, that they're advocates. Uh, they're aware of the food industry and, and have a sense on how they have this vision because they that's what you're managing against, right? They're internalizing everything that you tell them and they're creating this vision for what your co-op's going to be when I shop there. Um, and uh, I think it's really incumbent upon the general managers and the boards out there to try their best to meet that vision so we could earn them as customers. I would be certain that of the 1600 customers that, or owners that live in our market trade area, because we have owners outside the trade area, just about every one of them is gonna come in to see it, right? They gave us 200 bucks, they've heard us talk about it. It's what happens after they come in and see it. Did that answer your question, Kendall? Cool. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Awesome, awesome. Okay, moving on. Yes, I am. Okay, here we go. Produce, uh, our destination category. Uh, when shopping in a produce department, what do you value most in your item selections? So you can see here, local, um, the number one is quality. I think that would that doesn't surprise me a, a bit, uh, particularly with produce where you're buying with your eyes, right? Uh, what I think did surprise me is how low price is on that, on that range. So it tells me at least that we need to have a high quality produce category that focuses in on local and organic. Um, and price is not going to be the determinant factor for our at least owners shopping in the store. Cool. Did that spark any questions or thoughts? Maybe not. It did for no, me. I like okay. how I like what it shows. Can we go back to it? This is so interesting because I think when you if you did this survey in another community, I've seen stories in the community this pie would look very different. So I just want to stress how much Peter's, his, the vision that he and the board have created for how it's going to operationalize is very much drawn from this. This is a really clear story. Um, so when you see price that small a wedge, it means that of course value is important to people. Value is always important, but they have an ability to prioritize other things because of how big that wedge is. So I just want to say, like, yours might look really different, and I think this is just a phenomenal illustration. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. I would. I wouldn't presume anything. I would ask the right questions of your owners and let them tell you. Um, produce our diamond Sue. We're gonna have the best produce category in the market area of but course you're a food thing, but but, the, <laughs> but that's the very thing i'm warning you all against saying um because then you're setting that bar so high uh that'll be very hard to live up to okay we've got a question in the chat yay um which is were any of these results not what you or the board expected or were envisioning to get yeah i i was surprised by the results quite candidly i think the next one yeah the next one surprised me the most jq if i could jump to it Self-checkout registers, a lot of resistance. Before the poll came out, there was a lot of resistance. It's, it's not customer friendly. Uh, it's not what co-ops do. The question's simple. How often would you use a self-checkout register? Well, I was really surprised. 41%, almost half, say occasionally. And then 40% say frequently. 80 folks in my market trade area, 80% of people will use self-checkouts. Um, and I was really surprised about that and helped me um, sell the message to the group that the co-op today needs to think about tomorrow. 
and the way people buy foods um, is changing. Uh, and it will continue to evolve to this uh, self-checkout process. There are innate issues with self-checkout, don't get me wrong. It's still a very, very broken system. You're seeing margin erosion at Wal Walmart, Walgreens, all these stores that are engaged in self-checkout, you're seeing quite a bit of margin erosion. Um, and that's because it's not monitored as well as it could be. But the bottom line, JQ, are you surprised um, that 80% of folks that we surveyed owners um, say that they use self-checkouts. What do you think, JQ? I was blown away when you shared these slides. <laughs> I have to say absolutely blown away because we have seen very high resistance yeah. to, to in discussion. But this points to something that I wanted to ask you earlier because you're like, well, you know, people were really saying how important bulk is to them, how environmentally important. And it, it twitched this little itch in me that I know you've already considered, which is we both know that consumers don't, do always what they do doesn't always align what they think their values are right. and this is all of us as we always tell everyone they always said why don't we our bulk section is quite big by the way in my food quote but they're like yeah. why don't we expand the bulk section why did you put another four feet of chips and my answer was because you buy chips yeah, yeah. Um, it's so true you know and so, so i think true. this speaks to that too like no 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 self-checkout that's against my values do you use self-checkout registers yes i do i find them very convenient so it's really important to ask these questions. I never would have seen this one coming. I, I was surprised too. We, we drilled down on bulk a little bit too. We, so we asked in the bulk category, what do you buy? Um, so bulk body care, right? As an example, bulk grains. Uh, the number one, from a dollar standpoint, the number one sales in the bulk category is coffee. Uh, that would be number one. Uh, number two is candy. Uh, believe it or not, right? You're looking at super high retail price points. It's almost unfair. So if you're charging $6.99 for a chocolate covered almond and you're charging 49 cents for bulk oats, bulk oats has stands no chance at it, right? Um, it, it was a really difficult decision to even get it to a reasonable bulk category because I think that that uh, advocate would want bulk herbs, bulk spices, bulk teas, bulk nuts, bulk grains, um, bulk body care, bulk pet food, bulk pet food sells real well, by the way, um, and bulk nuts. And, and next thing you know, I look around, I was like, well, you want to open a bulk store? Um, there is one that opened up in Brooklyn that's no longer open. Um, I'm not saying that bulk's not a viable category. I believe in the bulk category. I oh, I do to too, bulk. but we all both know that those bulks, there was one in Austin, we can list them. There was one in Indianapolis. They all that's don't right. exist anymore. <laughs> they don't. They don't. They've been replaced with plastic stores. If Scott was on the call, he'd know what I mean. Did you see that? There was a recent article. There's a store in New York that recycles all the plastic, turns them into like fruits and stuff. And it's like a museum. And they, anyway, I, I, I lose, lose sight a little bit of the topic. But you, that, that's the challenge, JQ. And I'm glad you asked. It, is, if I open the store in the collective vision solely of the owners, it wouldn't be successful. They don't have the, they don't have the business IQ to understand what it takes to operate a grocery category or, or a grocery store. So one of the elements for the big chains is natural living or dietary supplements or wellness. Uh, it, it, you'll see those fairly expansive because they're the financial business engine. Uh, their contribution of profit is super high. So your margins are like 55% in dietary supplements and your labor is about 10%. So for every dollar you sell, 40 cents is going in your pocketbook. Produce is the antithesis of that. Uh, you're not dropping those dollars in. So um, it really depends on what the vision is for the collective base of the owners. And then saying to that group, well, you know, sales per square footage in bulk is really lower than a, a grocery table. I could sell more, you know, what uh, candy on a grocery table than I can bulk. Doesn't mean we shouldn't have a bulk category, no based on our core value of being the champion of the environment, we need a bulk category. We'll need to promote the Dickens out of it. Um, and you see that a lot in bulk categories with category discounts. Okay, how am I doing on time, JQ? You're Where's doing great. Time? You still have okay. another 20 minutes plus. Great. So surveying owners is super important, very easy to do. Um, me and Sue have been working on a series of these. Uh, so we're gonna continue to drive through it. Uh, we're gonna, Focus in on look and feel, which is where we're at for a company, and then look at each category and just start breaking them down uh, one at a time.
I got one more quick question. I think it fits yeah. here. How long before opening did you send out this survey? When would you recommend? Well, you know, ASAP, um, I sent this out super early. I think it was in um, March, I think it was. Maybe would you April. wait for the GM's arrival and design this together? I would, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. So when your GM gets here, get it on the to-do list. Yeah, you, you could be scientific. When we first put the survey together, um, we had a board member that says, oh, shouldn't we hire a professional and get real professional questions so we could understand the psychology, whatever. We're opening a grocery store. There are a lot of them out there. Let's just ask the question, do you do self checkouts? And it seemed to work for us. Um, and we're gonna continue that series. And one of the big wins is there's an engagement level that the owners want. They wanna be engaged at this level. Um, so we won't always follow what they want, um, but at least they could say they've been heard. Well, and I think to, to caveat to that is we will follow what they want, but we will do it in a business smart way. And it won't always be delivered exactly how they wanted it. <laughs> and I think that's what they want, JQ. You know, when I talk to the owners about that stuff and I'm candid with maybe their idea not really working in a business standpoint, and I give them the reasons why, they're very supportive of that. They're, they're really like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Um, I agree. That makes sense. I agree. I think some people just go, oh, people just don't, they're not smart. Well, people just didn't know. And you explain right. it to them and owners are completely supportive. They want a successful store and they see us compromising and doing our best to meet those things. Real quick question. I knew it was coming. Uh, your peers want to know if you can, would be willing to share a sample of the co of the survey questions or copy sure. of the survey. Absolutely. We'll, we'll send you whatever you want. Uh, okay. P6, for sure. Back to the slides. Okay, let's do it. We have just a couple more left. No more surveys. Um, let's talk about one of my favorite topics as I move my screen around, and that's owner-only benefits. We get a lot of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, oh, there you go. Uh, we get a lot of, so here's $200, I'm part of your group now, and what's in it for me? So what do I get? And that's a very fair question. I think we all kind of know what you get. In some ways, you're getting a resilient food supply chain. That's why the USDA is behind us all the time, is because they see the supply chain as being vulnerable, particularly in times of a pandemic. And I know COVID's behind us, I get that, um, but something's in front of us. And we need to make sure that we have food access that's locally driven. I think that's what you get, but that's not what they want to hear. They want to know about their benefits. So let's go through couple of examples of owner benefits. Are you ready? Patron dividends. Uh, we know about these, I hope, maybe. Patron dividends. Owners will get an annual patron dividend based on company policy in your co-op's profitable years. Now, when you tell that to an owner, they don't walk away remembering profitable years. All they remember is that we would give them a dividend check. The facts are this co-op needs to be profitable uh, before we issue dividend checks. So you'll need to underline that in your conversation. So if an owner comes in and says, well, what do I get? You could say, well, you get patron dividends, but here's the disclaimer. The disclaimer is going to take us like five years to become profitable. So you may not see a dividend uh, for some time. This is a way to share profits to ensure the co-op doesn't make too much money on your purchases. That's really the goal of it. We are a for-profit entity. It's what we do with the profits that's different, right? Uh, we funnel it through social cause. We, we funnel it through environmental purpose. And then we want to make sure we have a war chest too to make sure the co-op's healthy. Um, and then finally, whatever's left over after that, we give it back to you as an owner dividend. Next, our owner-only promotions. I love these. I have a, an example in the next slide. And, and these work really good. Um, so on an ongoing basis, I prefer monthly, the co-op's going to extend a cost-saving owner-only promotion. Welcome to the club. You are a part of the club. That means you get a special promotion. It could be a product giveaway. The most effective ones for me to drive traffic is category discounts. So once a month, I'll send out an email to all of our owners saying thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, your monthly promotion is 25% off bulk. We're going to need to work on that bulk category soon. That's for sure. Owner-only promotions. Next is owner discounts. This one I don't recommend, but it's your co-op. You can do it as you see fit. Owner discounts. Your co-op may offer owners ongoing shopping discounts. 
I've seen work weekly owner discount days significantly drive sales and traffic, which is cool. It just destroys your margin, right? Um, and I got JQ's head shaking, but I've seen it, JQ. Um, I personally don't recommend it. And my disclaimer- I'm, I'm just going to out. So you know I don't do this very often. Don't do this. Don't do it. I wouldn't do it You can't afford either. it as a startup. Owner discount days two to three times a year. See how much they're going to cost you because they're going to cost you a lot. And then factor if you can do more, but you can't and, afford this. And once you give it to them, oh. you can't take it away. It's done. You, oh. You're almost you, you're retracting it once the discounts in place takes time. This reminds me of senior discounts or student discounts or veteran discounts or this discount and that discount. Um, I would be very wary of that. I'm sure you, it's not your first rodeo, folks. You know that this is a business of pennies. Um, and when you start devaluing your goods based on discounts, it really affects your profitability. And then all your traffic flows to those days too. Um, so I would not recommend it, but I've seen it. And then finally, a community room. This is really important. So if you have a community room or a space to teach people about foods, the vendors are super supportive of that. So for those co-ops that have a community room, you could offer owner invitations and priority seating for training classes. And this seems to really be very popular for the owner group. Uh, the lure is popular amongst Miss L, I think, maybe, okay, amongst members as they'll feel connected to the store and it's ancillary offerings, so whatever else they're offering. So those are the four owner benefits that I focus on, um, but I wonder, you know, being kind of new, uh, what am I missing, JQ? Is there another owner benefit out there that didn't hit my radar? I think you hit most of them. Um, and I will say it's an interesting thing when you said, you know, you're getting this store, but we know they have to have owner benefits. And don't get me wrong, they do. But actually some of the most successful food clubs in the country have actually offer very few of them and actually don't even talk about dividends basically tell people nope we're gonna we don't our margins are thin and when we have extra money it goes to the war chest or goes in their case to expanding um and continuing to serve more and more of the community so it depends on your community how they feel about even having a list of these and i think you didn't miss any of them and i'd say be you know this is something for your gm to carefully think through the cost and benefits of each of these walk you through that and maybe co-make that decision. But some of these are far more costly than others. Some of them you would not be able to afford to layer. Um, we did have a question and I answered it, but I want your answer, Peter. Um, sure. What about staff discounts? So if you're against these owner discounts, what about staff discounts? I am pro staff discount. <clears throat> I think that it's really, really important. It's standard in the market area right now as well. So if you're gonna attract talented staff, you almost have to do it. Um, and uh, I've always been a, an incredible advocate uh, for grocery store workers across the country. Uh, we are essential service providers, and I, and I feel that we're undervalued. Um, so for me personally, I'm staunch in believing in uh, shopping discounts for employees. That would not include sale items because we have lost leaders. Would not include alcohol for a legal purpose or um, something else. I think it may be baby food, believe it or not. Um, Grant actually corrected both of us. We forgot yeah. an owner benefit. Which one? What am I missing, Grant? The owner tote bag. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh I sorry. never give anything away, Sue. Don't look at me I, like that. And it's the only thing we can give them years before we open. So it's been, <laughs> it's been great. I'm a fan. I do no, it, it really is good for stars. And I will actually say, um, Green Top, after they opened, did a points reward system for owners when they bought local through their POS. Uh -huh. And when you got to a certain amount of points, you, there were exclusive merch you could only get if you did it and people were into it. So owners could get this exclusive merch and no one else could and they developed points by supporting local and it was very popular. So do not underestimate the power of free merch. I agree. <laughs> I agree. You know, we're doing that. I'm looking at Sue, she put together an amazing bag design. I would say on your free bag merch, put the date on there, um, make it memorable. Mm -hmm. I'm still walking around that. with a mountain people's warehouse bag. Mountain People's Warehouse. Have Mountain, you heard of wow. Mountain People's Warehouse, GQ? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. But, that's, that is, but that is before my food co-op time, so yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you hold on to those things. They mean something to you. No, um, it's absolutely true. You're right. Bag. We would do limited a limited edition shirt each summer that was for owners, yep. featuring a different farm. People loved those. Oh, that was the one that came out, you know, that was from six years ago. And yes, I agree. Nice. But I love the idea of putting the date on there. I never thought of that. Got to get the date on there, Sue. Got to get the date on there. Um, and, and I want to underline JQ's point. 
I don't think these are mandatory by any stretch. You know, I think you could satisfy uh, converting an owner to a customer without these things. Uh, but once you do one, once you declare them, you're in, you know, you're all in on it. Um, you can't take away a senior discount from a senior. It's a bad look. Um, and once you promise an owner something, you got to deliver because that's where I think we're falling short. And I think that's segue to my next slide, but I'm not real sure. May I proceed? Somebody. Okay, keep on going. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> here we go. A couple of examples here. Um, so that's Brattleboro. Uh, we're paying out patron dividends. Uh, you'll receive a letter in the mail or an email. Yeah, cool. Right on. I think it's great. Uh, I really do. I'm sure it's not a whole lot of money, um, but it's the idea that they are owners um, and we are sharing in the profitability. And then here's one from Sugar Bee uh, Owner Sales. So I, I would presume that these are for owner-only sales. So this is their owner-only section where I guess your tension point is if you have a customer that comes in, right, that's not an owner, which is super important to us, they don't get that deal. Um, so if you're really publicizing it, I think you're putting your cashiers and your team in a really bad spot where, oh, well, you have to be an owner to get Annie's at 549. So we're going to get an extra 50 cents out of you today, pound sand if you like it or not. Um, we know our employees are, are much more customer centric. And, and I would presume that we all trust them to make those kind of decisions saying, oh, well, you got it for 549, but become an owner. Um, but uh, you do put your business in a, a wonky kind of spot for that. So a couple of examples. Peter, did we talk about owner bulk buying discounts? No, not, not no. Well, and only in the sense that that would be one of my promotions. So once a month, I'm going to send an email promotion and I'm going to focus in on category discounts. Um, so I would put bulk on sale today only for owner only at 10% or 15%. Okay. Uh, it makes the trip a little bit more worth it. And it allows me to drive categorically. So when I'm when you're open, I'm going to see the sales by percentage of store sales, and I'm going to be able to get my underperformers really nailed down. I'm going to be like, wow, bulk is only five percent. I need to drive traffic to bulk, um, and that's the way I'm going to be able to do it. I will mention that food clubs do do this. My home food club, if you pre-order a case, whatever the case quantity is, you get ten percent off, and it isn't a ton of sales. But your core shoppers like me, who need stuff that I know I need consistently and don't want to have to order it from online. Uh, we'll order cases of stuff and we have people who will drive out carts, but it's a small group of people, but it can be listed as an owner benefit. So and it, it costs you very little because not a lot of your sales go through it, but it builds loyalty. So it's worth considering. Yeah, awesome. Hey, you know, and another great thing, I'm going to move on here, but another great thing about the patron dividends, not only are you giving the money back, but you're making this statement that in this case, Brattleboro is a successful business. You know, that's a big statement to say, you know, we're successful as an organization. We're going to share that with you. Um, so I, I just think it's just a great thing. Okay, moving on. Uh, oh, here we go. I love this one. Yeah, expectations. A strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. That's the expectation. And as I mentioned in the beginning, don't overpromise on this expectation to earn your ownership base. Resist that urge to say, we're going to have the best grocery department in the whole world um, you're just falling, you're just bound to fall short of it. So resist the urge to overpromise on expectations. And then my final slide is just your key takeaways. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's what you want, right? You want, you want your owner to come in and throw a whole bunch of stuff in their cart. Um, so a couple key takeaways will open the form up, maybe give you back some time. Uh, number one, understand your target audience and what drives their shopping habits. Ask your owners what's essential to them and how they see the co-op when it's open. You know, when, when we did the survey, I was blown away surprised that we had 70 plus written responses to the survey. Um, so it really was uh, interesting to get that level of detail from our owners. Position your brand, build and then operate the store within the vision of the ownership expectation. Uh, we're forecasting 65,000 a week in sales. That's about 1,600 customers a week. 1,600 people uh, will be going through the POS, um, and half of them should be owners. So if we have 1,600 owners, uh, we need 800 of them to shop weekly in order to meet our performa. And then finally, 
your most crucial owner is the customer who regular. Oh yeah, I wrote that. Your most crucial owner is the customer who I'm still online that regularly shops at your co-op. Yeah, that's really important to know. So you may value the president of the board, um, but really what I value is the customer coming into my store weekly buying their food. That is our most important customer. And that's all I've got for the group. So um, that's all I got. Any questions? Yep, that's all I got. I'm going to stop <laughs> sharing. Um, JQ, thank you for having me. I, I hope I didn't bore everyone. I asked my wife any advice going in this thing. And she's like, don't be boring. And I was like, oh my God, I'm boring. Mary, I didn't know you? I was boring. <laughs> well, I, I, I've been married 25 years. When did I become boring? I mean, I, I'm still going to talk to her about it after this class. But <laughs> anyway, I hope I didn't bore you to death. I got you smiling, Mary. I see you smiling. Um, JQ. Any other questions? I, I've okay. got questions, but I could totally ask that. Anyone else got questions, things they want to bring up? Okay, I got no one unmuting, I don't think. Anybody? Okay, now I'll be talking over anyone. So I have to ask, you did the survey beforehand. You're gonna do your best to build the store to the way they expect. Are you planning to do a post-open survey once they've seen the place? Do you think that's valuable? Or do you think that basically if you got most of it right, the staff can observe what's going on and tweak and adjust? How will you kind of, I think it'll be it's instructive to us two board members to hear how will you stay on top of it? Because we, as you point out, we were talking beforehand, you will not get everything right in design, in, you know, in creating the programs and in putting out the products and, you know, you'll have some things that'll need to be tweaked. How do you go about that? Do you need input from owners? Do you just, the staff kind of picks it up? How do you, how do you plan to address it? Yeah, well, the dynamics significantly change. Um, we're a public business open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and owners, along with customers, will come in and tell us. And it's really it, the, the baton gets handed over to the teams that really execute this vision to listen um, and to react accordingly. And then we always have on our side the sales line, too, right, uh, where we're looking at financial matrix uh, to see what is and what isn't selling. Uh, ultimately, that's going to be the determinant factor. So if we carry uh, Annie's Bernios, for 429 and we merchandise them next to spaghettios for 99 cents um, and all we sell our spaghettios uh, we should be carrying spaghettios um, and that's the only way business has the resiliency to stay in business so hope that answered your question thank you i wanted that i wanted the board's people to hear that because i think it's going to feel a little um what i found is sometimes it feels a little disconcerting as those tweets and tweaks and adjustments are made um, you know, the staff is on top of those things from a number side, but also they're getting comments day in and doubt, out, comment boards, they're seeing what moves. And it's going to be less, sometimes your board members come and go, but I've had two friends tell me we need to carry X, you know, and they're just, and I just know a lot of people are really upset about this. And it's going to be a weird adjustment knowing you have thousands of owners, thousands of shoppers, and you're hearing from a couple, and you can pass that information on to Peter to share with his team but you have to trust the team with this right. vast amount of data to then make those adjustments. It becomes different. And I think that um, I've seen some more like, we need another survey. And I'm like, it becomes different. So you answered exactly how I was hoping. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you listen. I work for a company that had 15 locations. It was a co-op and they installed the PO, uh, self-checkout um, and they got a lot of complaints from their owners. So they removed all the self-checkouts only to have reinstalled them two years later. So it, it's an uh, interesting uh, way to uh, uh, move forward. Um, so you have to be wary. You absolutely have to listen to your owners, but you have to be careful of what the owners actually think. And I will feel quickly, right. I did a survey when I started with my, co my co-op, when it was tiny, it was all vegetarian. And uh, I sent out a survey. I was a vegan. I sent out a survey and said, do you guys want us to sell meat? And everyone was telling me vehemently no when they walked through the store. And then the survey, 78% of owners wanted us to sell meat. And there was another 10% that wanted us to, but didn't want to piss off the vegans. That's literally what they said. So the loudest voices aren't always actually representing your owners. And so hopefully you can trust the staff to, you know, through many different channels of information to really hear what they're saying. This was terrific and so helpful. Any last questions for Peter? I was just going to throw in there as well um, in conversations with Peter and this idea of 
people conjure up this image of what they think the store is going to be, and many of them are probably very far from what they're what the store is going to be. Thinking about a way to possibly use the survey less to get their ideas, but more to help shape what they should be thinking it's going to be. Not know not knowing exactly how to do that yet, but that was a thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Peter. Do you want to say a few words on how you do that? Well, you, you, well, you know, it's hard. Um, I think our biggest tension point, Sue, is going to be the size of the store. I think we've done such a great job talking about what we're going to be great at that people are going to be surprised when they get in there on the square footage. Um, so it's really important when we're engaging with them is to frame it well, is to put it in framework. Um, and the only, the not the only, but the best way that we're going to do that, Sue, is to compare it to another store that they shop at. So if they're shopping at Aldi's, we're two thirds the size of Aldi's. So it'd give you a sense of our space. Um, and then we could follow up, but we're going to kill produce. Um, that is going to be what we do best or else. And then we're going to make food in house and we're going to have a curated variety of grocery and a very limited dietary supplement section. It's not going to be our, our, our pillar of the business. And that'll, I think, frame them really well. Um, but also get them to become owners, which are essential for our business moving forward. Great question, Sue. Excellent. All right. I think uh, everyone just said this is super helpful. Thanks so much. Interesting information. It's always such a help to hear from the GM perspective. I know that I think uh, folks always find that super helpful. So thanks so much, Peter. I'm going to do our little wrap up here. And then if you do have follow up questions or want to be part of a little more discussion, we can hang out for a few minutes after the wrap up. But I want to again thank Peter so much from Food Shed Co-op for being here for our Earn Your Owners business session. It was terrific to hear the GM perspective. So excited about next week. I hope you the email's coming out tomorrow reminding you to register and what's coming up. Common Threads, again, LaDonna Sanders Redmond session. This is the first time she is sharing her research on the US cooperative movement and how it formed and how it was partnered with the cotton industry and slavery and how that shaped the, the, the US cooperative movement as we know it today. This one will not be released as a video for a year uh, to respect her wishes as she develops this and releases it at other conferences, but this will be the first time this has ever been shared. So really excited. Um, Rethinking Market Studies is gonna be a powerful conversation with the National Black Food and Justice Alliance about how uh, current market studies do and do not fit and serve black communities uh, that are building food cooperatives and then navigating partnerships and power dynamics. Don't miss this one with seven roots because this has everything to do with as you're starting to navigate lenders, uh, you know, granting bodies, the city who says they're going to do X for you, but then this organization wants to partner with you this way, and they're pushing and pulling you. If you're close in stage one or stage two, this is a critical conversation to be a part of. And they're actually going to have um, the project director uh, from Northside Food Co-op is going to be here with us, Sierra, talking about the realities of living through that. She is part of a project that has a lot of big, powerful forces moving their project backward and forward. I think it's going to be a great combo. This would not be possible, these whole video series, without the USDA, National Cooperative Bank, National Cooperative Grocers, and CoBank. Thanks so much to them for making it possible.